Well, there's a num number of ways. Uh, I guess I'll start out by talking about the way that we do it that maybe is a little bit uh, distinctive um, among business schools. The, uh, I think the, the signature element of our, our school, is our MBA program in particular compared to others, is what we call action-based learning. So right now, for example, all of our 425 first-year MBA students would not be found in Ann Arbor. Uh, they will be uh, scattered around the globe in uh, about 90 teams uh, working on real-world problems. So what we've done to try to differentiate our, our students and really provide value added was uh, probably about 10 years ago, slightly before I got to the school, we instituted uh, what we called this MAP project, which is called Multidisciplinary Action Projects. So we've since built that up and really invested in it as our point of differentiation. And so we source about 120 projects a year from, uh, from around the world of three different types. We have corporate ones, which would be like with a Fortune 500 company, entrepreneurial and nonprofit ones. And then after the students take the required curriculum from August through uh, the end of February, in March and April, the only thing they do is one of these projects. So right now, we has, as I was saying, we have all of our first-year MBAs out working on these real-world projects uh, uh, around the globe. So about half of them are outside the United States. And our thinking on that has been that um, clearly business schools have to be close to the world of practice. And you can get there a couple ways. One, is, one way is to try to import the business world into your school via, for example, case studies or, as we have done, recreating a trading floor that you'd find here in New York or another uh, uh, finance center in the world and bringing that into the school. The other way is you can take your students and your faculty and put them out in the world of practice. And so that's what we've done, uh, it really to try to uh, distinguish our program. And it, it's, it's a really great way of educating students and also a great way for us as the school to see what the interesting problems are out there in the world because in the course of having the students do these projects, we probably visit about 150 companies a year to ask them if we could do a project with them of something that's really salient for them today. So we get a pretty good sense of sort of what's on people's minds by the kinds of things they would like our, our students to work on. So I think that injection of our students and our faculty out into the world of practice on a full-time basis for two months of the, of the required curriculum in the first year, and we're doing this over and over and over. And so we're able to actually get a look at some, um, some problems in detail. So for example, a few years back, um, C.K. Prahalad, who's on our faculty, decided he really wanted to take a look at the issue of can businesses profitably serve the poor of the world? And so the basis for his getting a look at that question was to do 10 map projects with companies, or mostly nonprofit organizations, around the world. And that really was the raw data which became his book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. So I think in the way that uh, some other schools would try to have their connection with the world of practice be by bringing in outside speakers and making sure the faculty will bring current events into the classroom. We do all that the same as any of the leading business schools would. But I think this is what's really kind of been distinctive for us and has really been terrific in terms of a, a way for us to see what the interesting problems are in the world, for our faculty to be out there, and also for our students really to be solving real world problems and all their ambiguity and uncertainty that I think uh, has really been a hallmark of the school. Well, I think it is necessary to have a, a global presence in, in some way or another. And, uh, you know, you can do it in a number of ways and various schools ha have chosen different routes. Harvard Business School, for example, has chosen to set up research centers all around the world. Northwestern has chosen to do educational programs in cooperation with, with other schools. What we've done so far is really n uh, not to engage in partnerships with other, uh, with other schools around the world because we find that you sometimes don't have a perfect alignment of, of the agenda. So, so f at the moment, what we have is a, we have a research center in India. We have a, uh, 
We have a global MBA program that we run in, in Korea and China. And the major way that we go global is through these MAP projects and other global, uh, global projects courses. So I think, I personally believe it's really important for the students to experience a particular culture. I was in India in uh, last December, and I think just what you can learn from uh, intelligent observation of what's going on is really important. So we intend to be uh, as a platform for more of our action-based learning work outside the United States. We'll be establishing more uh, kind of small bricks and mortar investments. I don't think it's particularly useful to be going to another country and staying in a classroom and just studying in that classroom. What's important, I think, is to get immersed into the local economy. So whereas some schools are going global via, via setting up executive MBA programs around the world, I haven't seen much value in that to the students who are back at ho on, on the home campus. So our strategy is much more to figure out ways to get our full-time students who would be enrolled in Ann Arbor to get them out and have a global experience. So we'll be expanding on the um, MAP project activity. And I think to have a presence in country to help us with the sourcing of those projects and to, to help us with admissions of students from those countries to our uh, campus in Ann Arbor. Those are useful investments that we'll be making and expanding over the next few years. I didn't stay doing the uh, case math for 21 years if I didn't wasn't a proponent of it in some ways, but I think a sole reliance on it can be uh, can be a um, can be a limitation, and that's why when we were trying to figure out okay how do we really differentiate our school, it's not that we don't do any case studies. They are a tremendous device for developing students' problem solving skills, which are really uh, which are really valuable. But on the other hand, when you talk to companies, as I spent the majority of my first year doing as, as dean, going out and talking to companies and say, look, what really distinguishes your great people from your, from your good people? It was never, well, so-and-so is a great problem solver. It was always, well, so-and-so is the person who is able to see things that other people can't see. And he's also the person that when everybody else is saying, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We have nothing that we'll possibly be able to do to, the, uh, to solve this uh, issue. He or she is the one who's able to say, well, look, actually we have, th there's three different things we could do. So trying to think about, well, what do you, how could you develop the skills that go on the front end of a case study? That you develop students' ability to make sense of the situation and then really frame the problem. And so that's what we've tried to do with our action-based learning projects where as we send students out for a two-month project, there is no case. We give them a one-page description of the problem. And many times the problem is when you really look at it, it's saying, well, go help this company figure out how they could do better. So we deliberately leave the job of defining what the issues are and providing the students the space to really find the opportunity in the situation. So I a believer that the three fundamental ways that you can think about education, there being a professor up front lecturing, telling you what he or she has inside their head. Secondly, some case studies in which you are, are in discussion form and then also an action-based learning. Combining those three in the right way is what I think is the right way to do uh, both MBA and BBA education. Well, that's, uh, I guess that's my, what I think of as my, my primary job. And uh, I guess the, uh, a couple, well, a few, a few kind of everyday ways and a few uh, maybe a l little bit uh, kind of more abstract, I guess, uh, abstract ways that, that, I, that I try to do it. But I mean, in terms of trying to create a, a, a learning community, one, one of the things we try to do is uh, create a physical space to, uh, to accommodate a, a learning community. And so in our new building, what we have is it's all built around what we call the Winter Garden, which is where about 450 people 
will be sit, seated from about, gets going about 10 o'clock in the morning and it goes till about one o'clock at night. And so that's sort of the, the heart and soul of our, of our community. And I think the, uh, so that's one, is to have the physical infrastructure there. The second thing is from the beginning to be telling students about what their job is at the school. That, you know, our first test when we're deciding whether to admit you to the school or not is um, can you learn in this environment? So we don't do you any favors if you don't have the analytical skills to deal with the statistics courses or the business economics courses and so forth. But we're fortunate enough that we can fill the school up 10 times over with people who can learn effectively in our environment. So we get to create a situation where we're really choosing the students to join our environment based upon what we think they can teach the rest of us. So the idea of having a diverse student body in you know, gender, race, national origin, what kind of activities they've been involved in in the past, it really gives us the opportunity to think not of having 180 teachers, which is how many tenure, tenure track faculty we have, but if we think of ourselves as having 3,000 teachers, uh, because that's what our student body plus our faculty together. So I'm always trying to stress that we are a learning community. When we talked about uh, building our new facility, it was never about we're trying to build a great teaching facility. It was we're trying to create a great learning facility by having 3,000 uh, people who really have a teaching burden uh, for, the, for the rest of us. So those would be two. I guess the third one is you're always trying to attract uh, people who are going to bring excitement and intellectual curiosity into our classrooms and, and our environments. And then I think the fourth fourth thing is that you're really trying to create something uh, which has a high degree of excitement to it that we're always out there pushing new boundaries. And we had our prospective MBA students in uh, a couple weeks ago and I was talking to them about what I thought was some of the different things about the school that maybe they wouldn't see by reading our brochures. And I told them the story about when I was, I was on a panel of three deans talking to new PhDs and young faculty members from around the country about what does a dean do? And it was, you know, it's kind of an interesting question because faculty typically haven't really seen it very much up close and say that they don't know. And, uh, so the two deans ahead of me spoke about, well, basically what we have to do is we have to manage budgets and we have to make sure the priorities of the university are aligned with the school, and you know, which is something that I have to do, but it's not how I think about my job. And so I, so I told them that what I said to the audience was, well, how many Neil Young fans do we have in the audience? And, and there were lots of Neil Young fans, so I said, well, you know, one of Neil's songs on Heart of Gold DVD is about going out and uh, hunt uh, with his dog named King. And he said he loved his dog named King because he wasn't afraid of jumping off the truck in high gear. And I thought, well, you know, in some sense, that's maybe the most important thing that a dean can do is create an environment in which you can take sensible risks and, uh, and really bring so much excitement and energy into the into the day-to-day -day life of the school. And, you know, I had a finance professor come to me a couple of years ago and said, uh, I'd like to create a new course on sustainable finance. And I said, well, what what is it? He said, well, I'm, I'm not sure. He said, but it's something which is going to marry all of these concepts of sustainability with the world of finance. And so we said, yeah, we'll go, we'll go make that bet. And so I think it's the idea of, being willing to do some experiments, being smart enough to come back around a couple of years later and look at the flowers you've planted and see whether they're blooming or not. But I think to try to create a, a, a place that it's, uh, the academic world is great in the sense that, you know, the, the cost of an experiment is fairly low. And so we have to be creating a situation where we're going to go try things that you wouldn't be able to try other places. So, so I think it's always trying to inject that sense of excitement into the day-to-day -day kind of learning activities. Well, I think the, the short answer to that is uh, there's two, two pieces to it. One, one is to maintain a robust set of educational programs so that, uh, so that you have uh, 
lots of students who want to come to the school. But the second way, frankly, is uh, through the generosity of your alumni that um, with the state budgets being, uh, being cut as they are in Michigan and a number of other places, uh, we found a few years back that we were just not going to be able to be within the top tier of the schools competing with the people we want to be competing with if we didn't go out and raise a significant amount of money from our alumni. So we, uh, we started a capital campaign probably five, six years ago, which we just ended up and the timing was, was good for us, obviously. But, uh, but we raised $362 million against a goal of 350. And so it's really through the generosity of the alumni. And I think more and more, as difficult as fundraising may be in an economically difficult time like this, uh, for schools like ours, as we try to uh, uh, stay in the same league with the, with the private institutions, I think it's what the alumni are going to be uh, kind of support that they're going to be providing. So, so that is, I think, an increasingly important part of the financial structure of the school as, uh, as the state support has, uh, has dwindled. And you would expect uh, you could not form a viable strategy around increase, uh, seeing that you, believing that state support was going to be increasing in the future. I think it really is the alumni support, and we've been very fortunate that we've had some terrific alumni help us with that. And, and the second thing we, we did is we really didn't have the physical plant that would enable us to offer educational programs in a way which which had some economies of scale associated with them. And so as part of our capital campaign and part of the $100 million gift from, from Steve Ross, um, we just completed a 270,000 square foot facility, which came online a couple months ago. So, so we now have a great physical plant in Ann Arbor that allows us to do things in a very efficient way while we're still undertaking the action-based learning of dispersing our student teams around the globe which is a reasonably expensive way of, of doing education. So, so I think the, the two big things were, number one, to have, have a really good physical plant that allowed us to do things in an efficient way and keep to, uh, building the alumni relationships and uh, kind of making the case for alumni support. And we're very fortunate that we've had uh, a great history of uh, people who've been very committed to the school. At Michigan, our, our uh, model is that we're a pretty decentralized operation. So unlike some public schools in which uh, you would have to get presidential approval for a particular slot or the number of the tenured faculty, that's pretty much a decision which is left to us as the business school. So we have to be able to operate as an economically sound uh, institution. But as long as we can do that, we can grow the faculty as we, as, we, uh, as, as we wish. So we are not in a mode where we're saying, okay, what we're going to do is decrease the uh, number of tenured faculty as state support comes down. Instead, we're looking at ways to probably increase the size of some of our programs, particularly right now, the, the demand for our undergraduate business program is extremely strong. And while we were in a constrained uh, physical position over the last couple of years as we were under construction, we really had demand three or four X what our, uh, our supply was. So what we are trying to do is, is say, all right, is there a way for us to adjust the size of some of our programs so that we're able to maintain a, a sustainable economic model sitting underneath the school? And for us, I think the, the the, the big benefit is that we're an extremely diversified school in the sense of having both undergraduate and an MBA program and a master's in accounting program. And uh, also we're, we have a lot of uh, very strong demand for all of our programs. The program that is uh, a little bit of a challenge for us these days is our evening MBA program, which you know obviously is, is very geographically bound. And historically, that had served the automotive companies, and now, obviously, with their uh, economic difficulties, their tuition assistance programs have declined, and so, uh, as a result, our enrollments in our evening MBA program have declined. But that's about one-tenth of our overall, uh, overall 
uh, enrollment base. So, so what we try to do is maintain a robust set of educational programs so that we won't have to either cut the number of uh, faculty lines we have because it's really important to be able to continually bring in new, uh, new talent into the school all, all the time. So for this year, for example, while we're expecting that the uh, state budget uh, allocation to us declines, we'll be hiring six or seven new faculty members right out of PhD programs. Well, we're always trying to look at the world and, and, and do better and improve. And, and so certainly from my point of view, I look at the economic crisis, which has unfolded and say, okay, well, what's the lesson for us in this? I honestly don't subscribe to the view that uh, the crisis is something which should be laid on the doorstep of MBA programs uh, because we've trained a lot of the people who were leaders of the these companies. but. I do think there's a couple things that I take away from it. Uh, one is around our educational programs, but importantly, the second thing is around our research programs. And you know, I think if uh, I think if you look at what's happened, we in the academic world have done a great job of now reconstructing. Well, what was it that got us to this point? Obviously, that is of some value, but a far greater value is if you kind of get out ahead of the curve. So if you try to think about you know, what academia, what is academia's responsibility or job in this, I think it's quite significant because if you I mean, just arbitrarily say, look at the top 25 business schools in the country, and on average, they're gonna have about 20 finance faculty members. And so right there, you have 500 academic finance folks whose job is to observe and think. You know, that's the, uh, you know, us as a research institution, our faculty spend more of their time doing research than they, d than they do te teaching. So in some sense, I think academia you know, really has the responsibility. We are, in some sense, the largest think tank going. We're not biased to any particular point of view. And so for me, the question is, how can we sort of adapt and get ourselves more into the world of business and having our research impact day-to-day -day business activity. And also, I think one lesson I take from the recent events is that we probably need a tighter coordination between schools of business and schools of public policy. Uh, that, that would be another, another good thing for us to be doing. So, so I think for us in academia to try to move a little bit more in the direction of the world of practice and also finding ways to adapt our communication style so it's much more timely than is typical in our, in our world of referee journal articles to think about, gee, we really want to have impact on the world of practice and, and this is the way we, we should be doing it. You know, the second part of it, the uh, second lesson I take from the current uh, economic uh, crisis is if there is one dimension in which I think the, uh, the business model or the educational model of most MBA programs in particular, could use some variation. It's really in terms of the contact that we have with, with our students. And in some sense, a typical MBA program now, the average age is gonna be about 26 years old. So we have you come as a 26 year old. And I think of it this way, that if we said to you as a student, look, here is the intellectual buffet of the Ross School of Business. You can eat from this buffet for 20 months any time in the rest of your life. And you choose how much, how much you wanna consume when. If a student said to you, well, I think I'll consume for the next nine months, and then I'll go do a summer internship for three months, and then I'll go, I'll consume for another nine months, and that will be the end of our formal relationship for the rest of my life, rest of my professional life, we'd probably say, well, gee, that student wasn't as smart as we thought they were. And yet that is sort of what we impose on people. So as much as we stay connected through reunion activities, I think what we really have to do is say, we educate, if you look at people we educated in 1980, so we educated them in 1980 when they're in their mid twenties, and that would now put them at the point when they are the CEOs of the, the major corporations and in positions of leadership. If you look back to 1980, what do you see? Well, the three largest uh, employers in the United States were AT&T, General Motors, and Ford. 
the three largest employers today are Walmart, UPS, and McDonald's. So it's a different world from when you had your educational experience with us to what it is to, uh, today. And, second, and secondly, I think if you just look at what's happened with information and communication technology, we were not talking much about the influence of the internet on business activity in 1980. So I think this idea of us really forming a lifelong relationship with our students where we're not just educating you when you're 26, 27 years old and then saying, well, you know, I hope you read The Economist or tune in Big Think uh, every, uh, every once in a while to see what's going on, but to really think that we're going to have a lifelong relationship with you. I think that goes back to my earlier point about really looking at stimulation for research. If we every day had to be saying to ourselves, okay, our alumni are expecting us to provide insight into what's going on today, I think it will really stimulate a, a great uh, set of research activities. So, so I think those, those would be my main takeaway points that the, the research model that we have, we got to speed it up a little bit you know, if we're going to have influence on the front end rather than just be explaining on the back end. And secondly, we really should be taking uh, this notion of lifelong learning as, as a key part of uh, our uh, responsibilities to our students as an academic institution. In the near term, absolutely. I mean, what we have seen uh, just this year, uh, you know, certainly has been a, a significant de decrease in terms of uh, uh, recruiting activity on campus from the uh, from the financial community. We were reasonably diversified um, going into this. About twenty, somewhat less, between twenty and twenty-five percent of our students, our MBA students. We're going into uh, we're going into finance, so we had less repositioning to do than some of those 50 plus schools that um, that you'd be mentioning a moment ago. But definitely, we have seen uh, uh, a repositioning, and you know, many more of our students are interested in uh, uh, now going into a, a really a quite varied set of uh, set of positions. Consumer packaged goods is is pretty strong. Healthcare is obviously growing technology oriented things. So, so we're a general management school and our orientation to a general management and action-based learning has meant that we historically have been less oriented toward finance. Uh, but I suspect even for us being a general management school, the placement of our students in the finance world, I would, uh, we fully anticipate that that will be uh, a smaller percentage this year than it has been in, in the recent past. Well, I don't know that we have to incent them so much as that the market will incent them, <laughs> incent them to it. I, I, you know, I never, I never worried too much about us incenting students one de direction or another. I think our responsibility was to educate students, make them be thoughtful about their career choice, and then while some schools would look at their 50 percent of students going into finance and be horrified at that number or so many going into industries in which you don't quote make things. Um, I always felt our job was to really provide a great general man ex experience for our students and then if they chose to go into one industry or another that that was really their choice. So so I don't think it's so much that the company that the schools have to now incent their students to go elsewhere. It's just that there's always going to be financial activity, but just not at the scale that we've seen. And so as the salaries maybe come down a little bit in finance, uh, there won't be the strong economic incentive to go. And obviously, just if, if the jobs aren't there in finance, the students are going to be preparing themselves, I think, to, to have a little broader set of, uh, of options when they graduate. Not in my judgment. I think uh, I think business schools have really taken uh, to take taken the responsibility of developing some ethical uh, um, education into into the curriculum in a really substantive way. Schools have taken that extremely seriously, and if you look at what's been done over the last twenty years or so, I think the schools have done a great job. Uh, you know, the, the problem to me with the certification, uh, it, it's almost like, well, if we can check off the box, then we can forget about it. It was almost like in the old days when uh, 
everybody had to have a special little set of ethics and law courses that typically were required. And as long as the students took one or two, they were fine. And the ethical dimensions were not as then as present in the everyday conversation of the school. And I think what we've tried to do with the Ross School of Business, and I know my colleagues at a number of the other leading business schools have really tried to do the same thing, is to take ethics and sustainability and those kind of issues, to take them not as special topics which you cover in orientation and then say, oh, okay, that's covered. Now we can get on to the real stuff of marketing. But you have to embed the ethical discussions into the everyday life of the school. And I think you have to create uh, a student responsibility for doing that as well. So, so I worry a little bit about whether some kind of certification program or passing a test would lead us more back to the old days of saying everybody saying, well, okay, we have these few, few courses and, and we can check them off and, and really get, get the substantive uh, uh, focus uh, distracted from because everybody's worrying about showing that 99.9% .9 of their students pass some certification test. So, so I think this is a dimension on which I know business schools are frequently criticized at the moment, um, but if people really understood what is happening in the curriculum at school, and also I think in the wonderful, you know, the wonderful students that we and a number of the other schools enjoy these days, these students really are going to insist that ethics and sustainability be part of the everyday discussion of the school. So, so I really feel pretty good about where we, where we are on that. There's probably three different, three different ways that, uh, th that we would be doing it. One, one would be we have established a few years ago the Ross Leadership Initiative, which, uh, which one of the associate deans run, runs for us. And so that is an integrated package of material that, uh, that we use to bring up issues of social responsibility and business ethics. So, so I think uh, one of the important elements of our training is during your first week at school, um, during the orientation program, we spend one day on community service. And so we all go out and do a community service project. Then we all come back together, all 450 of us or so, and discuss about, well, what did we learn that day and what's the meaning of, of this kind of activity? So I think from very early on, what we're trying to do is get these issues of uh, uh, corporate social responsibility into the, into the minds of students. And then our Net Impact Club, which is, the, I think, the largest chapter in the United States, you know, which fosters the triple bottom line kind of philosophy of social responsibility, ethical responsibility, and, uh, uh, and, and, and profitability as, as three different important measures to be bringing into discussion. That kind of thinking is embodied in our in our everyday in our everyday classes, and so um, so I think those are two important ways. And then the third one would just be what we do in terms of bringing in um, outside speakers and through our club activities, like we have the Global Corporate Responsibility Group. So I think it's the way that we try to, as I was saying a moment ago, really have it be part of the everyday everyday life of the school. Well, I think the, uh, you know, I, I think the, it would be a good idea to, uh, to tie bonuses to, to specific performance uh, goals, I think. And, and that's something wh which seemingly has gotten lost, that, uh, that the bonuses, while people always call them bonuses, they really, in fact, in many industries had become more or less an entitlement where there wasn't a tie of, well, we'll get this kind of bonus assuming, assuming these kind of performance metrics. So I think incentive pay in general is not a bad idea. Uh, and certainly there have been lots of industries which have done much better because they tied the, they aligned the uh, financial performance of the firm with the with the financial rewards to, to the employees. So the idea of incentive pay, I think, I think is terrific, uh, but you just have to make sure that there are metrics that drive uh, the profitability of the firm, that those metrics are the same ones that the employees are being incented to. This is one of the uh, important things, an important change for uh, for business schools is to really be supporting that kind of that kind of activity because 
basically, um, the response, I mean, business is great when you're creating new products and ideas which are delivering value to consumers. And I think uh, what we've tried to do is really move away from, through our action-based learning projects, to really move away from business education being all about solving problems. And that's what a typical case study is about. If you pick up any of the case studies, they're typically 15 pages long. It's a statement of a management problem. Here are your options, A, B, and C. Which one of those solves the problem? But on the other hand, what you really want to be developing in your students is not so much a problem solving uh, capability as much as opportunity sensing. And so that's why we have moved to much more of an action-based learning orientation to, to try to help develop this entrepreneurial, uh, the ability to sense what other students, other people cannot, to really see what the opportunities are. So this has really been a focus of ours through both the general management program and the MBA uh, uh, generally, and also through our Zell Lorry Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies, where we've come up with a number of, uh, a number of new courses that, uh, that have really been quite uh, useful, I think, for our students. So we have one course where uh, we call it, a, it's a commercialization course where we basically hold up a sign to the rest of the University of Michigan and say new product ideas, bring them here. And then our students vet those new product ideas. Uh, most of them would come from either the engineering school or the medical school. And then uh, through donor support, we are able to actually invest in those companies if we believe that those are the kind of uh, right kind of metrics that they have in place and right sort of op opportunities uh, for them. So, so I think the idea of a business school really having a role in fostering the innovative capabilities is something which is really important for us. And also what we're trying to do is extend the business school's impact across the university via the course I just mentioned. And we also offer a course now that we call MBA Essentials for Entrepreneurs, which we teach the faculty and the graduate students of the other schools at the University of Michigan other than, other than the business school. So I think the, uh, the idea of a business school as a force for innovation and entrepreneurial activity is something that we believe in uh, greatly. And it's really helping us attract uh, some really interesting students who I think really get the, they need the fundamental training in business, but then to really being applying it to entrepreneurial activity, I think is what, something we're seeing a big increase in. One of the things that we've been trying to do is, uh, is find ways to make entrepreneurship not be a little company activity, but in fact, and when you think about it, it's probably gonna have some of its big pack, biggest impact in, in, in the larger companies. So, so I think, uh, you know, we've worked in our executive education operation with a number of large companies trying to share the lessons uh, of entrepreneurship uh, with them. So I think that's, that's one way. And, uh, and I think another way is really uh, via the projects that we've done with a number of large companies trying to help bring some more entrepreneurial ideas to, to their environment. I think the... Uh, I think the biggest thing is to really have the attitude that um, you really, it's likely that this time is gonna require you to reinvent yourself. You know, so many companies that, uh, that I hear uh, talking about their strategy and it's basically to say, well, we're gonna kind of hunker down and when things turn around, we're gonna be really well positioned. Well, I'm not sure when things turn around and I think that's really the, the wrong idea. Uh, is to say, okay, we've had some strengths. Those strengths are going to be the ones that are valuable in the future as soon as we get out of this little bit of economic difficulty. My sense is that the, the better companies are really looking at themselves and saying, okay, we had some historical strengths, but those aren't necessarily going to be the things that are going to get us anywhere in the future. So we have to really reinvent our, uh, reinvent ourselves in a way to, to be in touch with the kind of new opportunity. So, so I think the, sometimes these major disruptions or major changes in the markets are really great opportunities because they can unfreeze things. Discussions which would not 
be taking place uh, in a normal environment, the opportunity to maybe upsize something and downsize something else. I think the really good companies are kind of looking at the the current situation and saying, okay, I understand that regulatory environment is, is changing dramatically. I have to think about how that impacts me. But the important thing is to understand the new degrees of freedom that the, the status quo not being acceptable to anyone anymore, that freedom to really uh, do some things which might not have been possible before, I think is what the great companies are taking advantage of right now. The one that really concerns me the most is that if we're going to make a turnaround from uh, our ideas on globalization and the uh, kind of inclusiveness of the American economy uh, to people from around the world. For example, we uh, the uh, restriction right now on international hiring of uh, of student hiring of international students, I think, is really problematic. So. So we're seeing uh, a potential declining interest in the best people from around the world coming to the United States because of this notion that, well, if you're accepting TARP money, then you can't use that to hire anybody who isn't a, a U.S. citizen. So, so I worry a little bit that in these times of economic difficulty and increasing unemployment rates, while I think uh, we have to do everything we can to provide employment for, uh, for the citizens of, of this country, I don't think the, uh, the notion that we should do this by putting up barriers around the, uh, around the country and restricting the employment of uh, really talented people from around the world is the right way to, to do it. I think, I think the inclusiveness of uh, the American business society or business culture has really been one of its great strengths. And I'd hate to see that lost in this economically difficult time. You know, it's kind of interesting to uh, to think about how Wall Street uh, Wall Street has really been dispersed around the world with what's happening with uh, with information technology, and uh, so uh, I mean, it's going to be a uh, interesting set of global participants rather than the ones who are physically here in New York City. And I think the, that, will, uh, that will really increase the extent to which all of business is globalized. I think it's that, um, well, t two things. Number one is that if you looked at the savings rate of the American consumer, uh, and see it be zero or a negative number, I mean, nobody really could have thought that was a very good idea. Uh, and so, um, so that, would be, that would be one, uh, one particular issue, I guess. And, and the second one, I think, is, uh, is somewhat related, is that um, the, it's, it's hard to, you have to protect yourself against more downside than we maybe once thought. I mean, I think the idea of the Dow going from 14,000 down to, uh, you know, the sevens, uh, there were probably weren't many people who thought, gee, I really needed to protect myself against that. So just the whole idea of risk management, um, I think we all need to be more thoughtful about what that really means on an individual consumer basis. And it's kind of hard, I think, as you saw the returns to, uh, that one was getting from being all in equities to say, gee, I am getting a little bit older. I know the theory says I should be jumping out into uh, equities, into, into fixed income things. But the idea of really uh, thinking, being more thoughtful about managing the risk in your life and not being so tied to current consumption as we were as a society, I think are two things that I take away from the last uh, 10, 12 months. That's uh, that's a that's a good question and one that I've thought about thought about a lot. Um, you know, I I think a leader is a couple different aspects to it. One is one is that a leader is somebody who's developing great talent around him or her. That the organization is just getting better by this person this person being there, and the leader really takes it as part of their job 
to be developing the talent of the people in, in the organization. Second thing I really think is an important distinguishing characteristic uh, of leaders is uh, they they see new opportunities. They're always pushing the organization out in, in new directions. And the third thing I think is that they really bring kind of a moral compass to the, uh, to the organization, that, that they're the ones whose values that are, are really going to be expressed for the rest of the people and be adopted by, by the organization. Whereas a manager can you know, very effectively kind of manage the status quo and, and do things in a way that delivers historical profitability, I really think the leaders are the people who are really seeing the new opportunities and establishing the values for the organization. My biggest leadership challenge would, would be my first year as uh, my first year as dean of the the Ross School of Business. You know, I had been a faculty member at the University of Chicago and Harvard Business School prior to becoming dean, but I became dean in late summer 2001. And uh, you know, of course, we had September 11th uh, occurred probably about a month after I was on the job, and the job market kind of. Uh, declined rather rapidly for our students. And um, the, the problem was you come in as dean and within a heartbeat, everybody is saying to you, well, what's your vision? And, uh, you know, the truth of the matter was that I didn't have it yet. I had just come to the school. And so I think the uh, looking back at it, the probably the hard thing for me for six months was that I was going around meeting a lot of the alumni, giving presentations, and I was out a little bit ahead of myself because if you said, well, what's your strategy? I couldn't say much other than I'm all for quality and go blue, which you know, was fine, but it doesn't say anything. And so uh, I think it was the leadership challenge for me was to really take my time to do my homework even when the stakeholders were getting impatient. It would have been a real mistake for me to kind of have adopted a strategy without any edge to it in response to the kindly uh, pressure, but it was still pressure from some people to say, okay, you've been here 100 days now, and if we read one of those airport books, it says the CEO only has 100 days to really bring change to the organization. By then, the degrees of freedom are gone. I do not subscribe to that. And so I think it was to really stick with it and think my way through it and go out and visit enough companies so that, uh, so that I could really get a vision of what I wanted to try to do to the school. And it was really a valuable exercise for me because there was one person who really helped me greatly get my vision for the school because he said, he said, you know, business schools are great. He said, but what they do is they say we're going to give a certain set of knowledge, we're going to give a certain set of skills, and we're going to develop students' leadership capability. And he drew three uh, uh, circles of the same size with the little leadership piece sitting up on top of the other two. And he says, so what you say you're going to give us is three grapefruits. He said, but in reality, what you give us is two grapefruits and a grape, with the grape being obviously the leadership capabilities. And then he said, now, if you could figure out a way to really distinguish yourself around developing those leadership capabilities, that would help set you apart from all the other business schools out there. And that really became kind of the strategy and then saying, okay, well, action-based learning, I don't know how to make that grape into a grapefruit by keeping the students in a classroom. If I can get them out into the world dealing with messy problems as part of a diverse team that we put together rather than have them being able to go with their buddies, that I think is the way to develop, uh, to develop that kind of leadership capability. So, so that was one personal thing for me that uh, it took me sort of longer than a lot of people hoped it would. It would have been nicer if I came up with the idea a little bit more quickly than I did, but, uh, but I think for me to be able to to kind of work my way through a process that worked for me and then really having a strategy, which has, has really served us very well in, ret in retrospect. So, so I think that was one personal one for me. Fantastic. Oh, the best management advice I, I ever got is, uh, you know, I'm a marketing guy, so uh, it really is around, uh, 
It really is around the importance of focus and, and differentiation, that if you try to think about being the best in the world for everybody, that, that sort of leads you to, to really dilute your offerings and not be, not be great for anybody. So, so I think the idea of really having a focus and, uh, and saying, gee, this is what we do. We honestly think we're the best in the world at that. If this is what you're looking for, that's, you, you, you ought to buy our product. You ought to come here rather than trying to spread yourself out too thin. So, so it's kind of basic stuff about uh, marketing management, about segmenting the market and really picking a spot. But it's much harder to do than, uh, than a lot of people think it is because you should be saying enough about your product that some people aren't going to want it. And if you can get yourself to having enough confidence in what you're doing so that you say, gee, it's okay if there are some people who don't want this product at all, I think that's when you know you've gotten to a point of really developing a, a focused offering. So I think there's lots of examples of the benefit of, of focus and uh, you know, certainly from my personal experience in, in what I've done as a, as a marketing academic, as consultant and a dean, uh, I keep get being reinforced in the lesson of a lesson of the importance of focus and really developing a particular point of differentiation that you are the very best at that particular thing and nobody can compete with you on that. Best personal advice, uh, I guess. Uh, I, I guess in in sort of recent uh, recent times, I, I guess it would be. Uh, um, sort of the, the, the advice to really think about um, continuing to, de to develop as an individual, and that may mean uh, doing some new things that you're really not very comfortable with. And I've always been, and it's, it's really what led me to leave Harvard Business School and go to the University of Michigan, because I've always been a preacher to everybody else about look, you have to, if a new opportunity comes, even if it's outside your comfort zone, you have to go, you have to go do it and develop new muscles, otherwise you don't grow. And so this was something where I had, uh, as I said, been a preacher about this to many, many people. I had been at Harvard Business School for 21 years. I had no intention of going anywhere else. I was just about to become the senior associate dean at HBS, but there was nothing about that job that scared me. Whereas thinking about becoming dean at a school where I didn't have a stock of goodwill and would require me to do things I had never done before, for example, like fundraising, uh, in the end, the things that initially scared me and maybe hesitated about Michigan were the things that made me go there when I saw them as a chance to develop in ways that I hadn't really developed uh, before. And, you know, fortunately for me, they've been some of the most satisfying aspects of the job. So, so this idea of always be thinking about the need to develop yourself, the cap to have the capability to reinvent yourself, I think that's something that's, that's very important, uh, very important to me. A couple things. Uh, one, one is they should really... Uh, they should really figure out if this is something that they really want to do at this point in time. You know, I think obviously I'm in the uh, business school business and I think it's great, but it's not great for everybody. There are some people who, uh, you know, don't, uh, it's, it's not going to fit them very well for what they, what they want to do in life. So I, I would say that that's the first thing is to really do your homework to decide, gee, is an MBA degree going to get me where I want to go? Second thing I would say is that um, the difference between schools, um, even the ones that might be frequently rated the same or mentioned in the same kind of articles, the difference among them is phenomenal. You know, I myself, I've been at the University of Chicago, Harvard Business School, and the Ross School of Business. Those three places, even though we all grant the same thing at the end, an MBA, totally different ex set of experiences, totally different set of skills that you're going to have when, when you co come out. So in terms of assessing which one or which one of the many options that, that you're going to have is best for you, really requires you to, to be very self-aware 
and understand what your skills are, which one of those you want to further, which ones, are, where are your deficiencies, can you leave those deficiencies as deficiencies, which you sometimes can do, or do you have to remedy them, and then really studying the, the schools in terms of how is each one going to progress you on your, your individual path. And, you know, I, I know all of us as uh, the deans of the major schools, what we really try to do is be articulate as we can about what we can do so that somebody doesn't wind up at our place by mistake. And I would much, you know, if you want to be a quant superstar, I'd much rather tell you that, gee, the University of Chicago, based on my experience there, is probably better at that than, uh, than any school I know. And if you really want to develop general management skills from an action-based learning perspective, that's what we think we do better than anybody else. So, so rather than looking at any one of the ratings agencies and thinking that number four is much different from number six, to really look very closely at, uh, at what one of these very different programs is going to do for you as an individual. Uh, no, I couldn't. I, uh, I will, uh, other than uh, obviously the Ross, Ross School of Business, but, uh, you know, I, uh, as I said in answer to your earlier question about what advice would I give to somebody going to an, an MBA program, it's really these the schools are really so different from one another you have to do your homework and and i sometimes uh tell tell students that you know i have a 31 year old daughter who uh actually got a master's degree in educational policy rather than M an mba but that's that's another story but i said you know there are there are lots of great schools in the united states and around the world that i would have been delighted to see my daughter go to about 25 different places. And so it's really all an individual fit for yourself. And as I say, I think there are terrific schools and uh, each one is different in their own way. And uh, I think if you can really do your homework on them, you'll find one that really works for you. Mm -hmm.